Right, um, so uh, afternoon. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the Atkinson's online talk series. My name is Jo Chamberlain, if you don't know me, I'm the Heritage and Participation Officer of the Atkinson. Um, so today's talk is an old friend of ours, um, Jo Backhouse, way back in the midst of time, um, actually even helped us put the exhibition together that is still on display at the Atkinson, which is the collection which was put together by Mrs Goodison. So Jo's talk today is going to be looking at the collection and looking a little bit at Mrs Goodison herself. Um, hopefully some of you will know the collection. Um, if not, feel free to come along and see us at some point. The Atkinson's open uh, all through the week, Monday to, uh, Monday to Saturday, 10 till 4. Um, and uh, I shall pass over to Jo, who is now going to start her talk, which is about Mrs Goodison and the Goodison collection at the Atkinson. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much for that intro, Jo. Uh, let me see if we can share screen. I'm just trying to get this in. Um, oh, sorry, it's not what I want. Right then. There we go. The buttons were not in the order I was expecting. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for that intro, Jo. Um, and I'd like to thank Jo for asking me to come along and give this talk. Uh, the collection at the Atkinson has a very soft spot um, in my heart. As Jo said, um, I um, assisted uh, when uh, we catalogued the collection uh, way back in 2013 to 14. Uh, so what I'm going to have a look at uh, this afternoon is uh, the acquisition and how, how the, the, the collection came here, uh, the nature um, of the objects that form the collection, uh, some key pieces, and then I'm going to look at temporary exhibitions. Um, because the Atkinson is very clever, it has a standing collection which is always on display. It then uses that to uh, facilitate temporary exhibitions with the addition of loan pieces. But we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Um, so, um, if we just think, uh, the acquisition, how the collection uh, came to be here. Uh, the collection um, was, uh, was bought uh, by a Mrs. Um, Anne Goodison. Um, and we know uh, very little about Mrs. Goodison, uh, unfortunately. Um, she uh, um, marries um, a George Goodison uh, when she's 23, uh, and they live at Beach, Warn, uh, Beach Lawn at Waterloo, so she is a local lady. Uh, and that's really one of the, the beautiful aspects of the Atkinson collection, is that it tells uh, the story of collecting um, in the 19th century. Uh, and it also uh, tells the story of a local lady. Um, I'm just checking. Uh, I'm presuming that everybody can see me and everything um, is OK. Um, if not, um, hopefully uh, somebody uh, will let me know. Um, so uh, Mrs. Goodison uh, is a local lady. So we have this dual aspect um, of the collection, uh, the story um, of ancient Egypt and a local lady. Um, so uh, she marries George when she is uh, 23. Um, and um, the, 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 the concept um, of the, the Goodison collection, he, um, he works, he, he's a civil engineer um, and he works uh, at laying uh, the, the storage system. Um, and um, the, the road, one of the roads that he works on um, is named after him. Uh, on this road, at a later date, uh, the football club um, is established and then this takes the name of the road. Uh, 
back in the eons of time, somebody uh, once asked me, um, is there a connection to football? I have no interest in football. Uh, so uh, this was something that I hadn't even thought about. Uh, but uh, Mrs. Goodison uh, collects uh, the objects which form the basis of this collection um, on two trips that she makes uh, to Egypt uh, later in the 19th century. Um, now, if we just have a look um, at these dates, um, and try to fit them in the into the, the, the context of um, of travel uh, to Egypt. And um, if we think that um, Cook took his first tours to Egypt in 1869, this is still quite quite a, an adventurous thing to do. Uh, Florence uh, Nightingale she had visited earlier in 1849. And Amelia Edwards, who we'll talk about later, she visits in 1873. Um, but this concept of trips to Egypt, um, this is an acceptable thing for middle class ladies to do. Um, if we think that the Egypt Exploration Fund, their early trips, uh, their early excavations um, were um, looking for the evidence of the Bible. So uh, being interested in, in Egyptology was seen uh, as an acceptable pursuit. Uh, so Mrs. Goodison collects these objects um, on her trips to Egypt. Some of the objects are also um, purchases and she purchases those with the help of Reverend Chester. Uh, now Re Reverend Chester um, was an ordained minister but due to ill health um, he really stopped practicing. Um, he visited Egypt um, for his ill health and he was great friends with the excavators um, and he really purchased objects for many uh, museums including the British Museum, World Museum, Liverpool and the Ashmolean. Uh, so Mrs Goodison was in good hands uh, really um, by, by seeking the assistance um, of Reverend Chester. You will notice sadly there is no photograph here. Um, Joe and I have uh, searched in vain to try and find a photograph of Mrs. Goodison and uh, so far uh, we have failed. We still do live in hope. Um, so um, Mrs. Goodison uh, dies uh, in 1906 at age 61 uh, and at this point in time her husband um, puts the collection up for sale. Um, if we were in a, a lecture theatre now, um, I would ask us all to boo, uh, but obviously you'll just have to have a little quiet boo um, in your own um, in your own home. Um, and he um, he asks for four hundred pound, uh, and this is to Bootle Museum. Um, Bootle Museum uh, do not have four hundred pound, uh, so the curator and uh, Mr. Hunt. He contacts a local businessman, uh, Mr. Thomas Davies, um, who, who was retired, but who had traveled extensively to Egypt. Um, and he offers to purchase uh, the collection. Um, and it is purchased uh, in 1908. Um, so uh, at this point in time, uh, the museum then, uh, Bootle Museum, that they are quite uh, forward thinking in the sense that they ask Professor Newbury uh, to catalogue the collection. So they spread the collection uh, out um, in its entirety um, and they, they, they catalogue the whole collection before it goes on display. Um, and that is, is, is an absolute wonderful resource uh, and um, really ahead of its time. Uh, we will notice, sadly, we also have a blank space here. Uh, assisting uh, Professor Newbury with the cataloguing was Meta Williams, who was uh, a secretary uh, at the Institute of Archaeology at the University of Liverpool. Uh, sadly, uh, that this talk <coughs> could be called the Invisible Women in Archaeology because we also don't have a photo of Meta, uh, which again um, is quite uh, quite frustrating. Um, but it's really um, from the, the, the work of, of Newbury and Meta that we have the first catalogue um, of the collection. Uh, the, um, as a thank you uh, to, uh, to Meta, uh, 
she was given uh, this rather beautiful um, photographic album, which records um, how the objects were displayed in Boothal Museum. Um, and um, they, they went on display in 1910. And we can see from the images, um, the the, uh, the style is very object rich, but this is quite common at this time period. If we look at um, images from the likes um, of the British Museum, um, it, it is the cases are ram packed um, full with, with, with many um, artifacts. Uh, so the, um, the collection is on display in Brutal Museum uh, until 1974, and then, uh, then it, it, uh, it closes. The objects are transferred uh, to uh, the uh, Botanical Gardens uh, Museum, which is um, in Christchurch, not far um, from, um, from Southport. Um, and it remained in storage uh, until it went on display in the Atkinson in the October of 2014. So for 40 years, this wonderful collection um, was, um, was in storage. Uh, so this is how a collection has um, has um, arrived um, at Southport. The Atkinson uh, did receive uh, some uh, lottery funding, uh, some heritage funding, which allowed them to create the galleries uh, to display the collection. Um, and this is the series of boxes uh, that uh, the collection um, arrived in at the Atkinson. Um, it was uh, an absolute joy uh, to work with Jo and uh, one day a week we would unpack these boxes um, and we would catalogue the material. Um, and Every day we had um, a different favourite because these objects hadn't been seen. Um, Earlier in uh, 1995, the, the collection had been uh, catalogued by Rosaline David uh, from Manchester Museum. Um, but uh, Joe and I were really uh, cataloguing the material with a view of how it was going to go on display, what themes we could pull out um, and how, how we could link, um, link the, the, the objects and to provide um, a, a meaningful narrative. Um, in total, there's about a thousand objects in the collection, but there's only about 250 to 300 on display. The rest are in the stores, which pre-COVID uh, we, we could use for handling sessions uh, and also uh, to create temporary displays. Um, this is just one example uh, and it was really uh, Joe and I were like children um, at Christmas as we un, um, unwrapped these boxes um, and it was a, a real joy to, to be part of this um, and these were the themes that uh, we uh, decided uh, would best illustrate uh, the material in the collection. Um, the collection is diverse. It has material from the pre-dynastic, so about 4000 BC, uh, right up until the Coptic period, uh, so uh, about 400 um, AD. Uh, so we have a real breadth um, of material here. And Mrs. Goodison clearly had uh, an extremely good eye uh, for collecting these objects. So I thought we'd start um, with the bar bird. I'm going to pick out some key objects uh, and um, I'm going to talk about them with the, the hope that uh, when you visit the Atkinson, if you haven't already done so, uh, you will have a, a better understanding um, of the objects. Um, and I started really with the, uh, the bar bird because this, um, this object was the first um, Egyptian themed object of the month, um, which I did uh, not long after the, the gallery um, had first opened. Um, it is a, a, a beautiful example um, of a bar bed. Um, these um, objects are, are common uh, in the 25th and the 26th dynasty, so quite quite late in Egypt, uh, 600 uh, to 700 BC. Um, it is wooden and it has gesso, so like a plaster, uh, which has um, 
uh, gives it almost like an undercoat and then it has been painted. Uh, its wing has uh, been broken slightly here. Um, I think it has also been 3D scanned uh, by uh, Lee um, and it is a, a wonderful object. Uh, it, we see uh, that the, 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 the bar bird from about the 18th dynasty, uh, so about 1500 BC um, in ancient Egypt, um, in two dimensional images. Um, and the, the bar bird is representing uh, your, uh, a spiritual aspect of you. The, the Egyptians um, have believed that there, there were different um, spiritual essences of you. Um, there is your car, which is really your, your life force, which comes into existence when you're born. Think of it as, 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 as energy. And then there is your bar, which is your individual essence, what makes you, you and me, me. And in the New Kingdom, the bar is depicted as a bird. Uh, and it is the concept of movement that, that is significant, uh, <clears throat> that the barbed can travel between the realms of the living um, and the dead. The bar here, of course, um, has a beautiful solar disc on it, and that really give, gives us the, the, this clue about linking the, these realms um, of the living um, and the dead. Um, when Newbery um, catalogued the museum, uh, the collection, um, he produced these absolutely beautiful uh, individual museum cards. Uh, the, uh, the Atkinson still has um, most of these. One or two have gone missing over the, uh, the ravages of time. But these are part of the social history um, of the museum. Um, and they are also a wonderful resource. Now, of course, museums use a variety um, of software. Uh, modes is one of them where, where you can include um, photographic images and uh, textual data about the objects. Uh, but these um, were stored in a long, um, in a long um, file, very much like you would see in old, in old libraries, like a card index. Um, this is how the bar was originally uh, displayed um, in the Bootle Museum. And it's actually an incredibly good interpretation of where a bar bird would have been placed in a tomb. It would have been placed very close up to the, the, the coffin um, of the deceased. Um, <clears throat> And this is because uh, if we just have a look at this image from uh, a, uh, the, the Book of the Dead, uh, this illustrates really uh, that the, the, the role the bar played in the afterlife. Books of, Deads, uh, of the Dead is a papyri uh, that will be taken into the afterlife to aid your rebirth. Uh, it would be perhaps placed inside of the coffin. A mixture of prayers, recitations, and images. Uh, but what we can see here, the deceased is depicted in front of his tomb. He's having the opening of the mouth ceremony carried out upon him uh, so he can be revigorated, he can smell and see uh, and his senses are alive again. But down here in the burial chamber, this uh, is a representation of his coffin. So his coffin is, is below. Uh, this is the tomb um, superstructure above ground. Below we have um, his coffin in the sealed burial chamber where he will remain safely. And if we have a look here, this is the burial shaft. We can see there is a beautiful image of a bar bird and it is carrying a vase and a loaf of bread. So it is bringing sustenance. And that is the key feature of the bar. The bar can leave the tomb and it, it, it can uh, bring back food and drink for the deceased. And that's why these beautiful bar birds were left inside um, tombs um, in ancient Egypt.
Uh, this is a fantastic representation uh, from the Book of the Dead um, of Annie, uh, and we can see his bar is hovering above him. Uh, and as I said, how the the bar was displayed in the original Bootle um, Museum was a really good interpretation um, of the, the object, where it would have been placed, and very importantly, how the ancient Egyptians viewed the concept and the importance of the bar bird. Um, we can see the bar um, has human features um, and really that is a key component um, of the representations of the bar birds. Uh, this example in Leiden we can think of as perhaps um, a more elite, uh, a more expensive, a fancier example than the bar um, at the Atkinson. Uh, we can see the bar at the Atkinson has been painted yellow. Uh, but the uh, example at Leiden um, indeed has a gold face. And if we look at the Book of the Dead, uh, the, uh, the, the papyrus roll, which um, it, it is created to aid your afterlife, uh, one um, of the recitations uh, tells us it is to be spoken over a human headed bird of gold inlaid with semi-precious stones and laid on the breast of the deceased. So that is clearly what our bird is, is trying to look like. It's trying to look as, as if it, it is made um, of gold with semi-precious stones. Um, and then we, we, we have the, the, the recitation, Oh, you who bring, you who run, you who are in the booth of the great God, let my bar come to me from anywhere it is. <clears throat> so hopefully when you view the bar now at the Atkinson, you will have a, a better understanding of the function of it. Uh, and if we just look um, at the, the Book of Annie again, we can see that the bars take on the, the characteristics of the deceased. We have Annie and his uh, wife, Tutti, and the bars are taking on their individual um, human characteristics. So uh, the headrest um, is another wonderful um, object that is part um, of the, the Atkinson collection. Um, headrests um, are incredibly interesting objects. Um, they are used in daily life. The Egyptians did actually sleep on these um, and they also took them into uh, the grave, uh, into the tomb. Um, other cultures do use headrests, even though that they do look uh, very uncomfortable. There is actually um, a, a replica at the Atkinson, which you did used to be able to try pre-COVID. Um, I'm not sure whether that's, uh, that's possible um, anymore. Um, but uh, the, the, uh, the headrest um, is a, a functional um, item, but it does have deep significance. Uh, they're found in wood, uh, as this example, in faience, um, in stone, uh, and we find them from uh, the Old Kingdom um, onwards and until the uh, late period. Uh, this is a rather grisly photograph um, of one of Reisner's excavations um, at Giza. So it's an old kingdom burial uh, near the pyramids. And we can see the headrest was placed uh, here um, directly under the head of the deceased. Uh, Reisner found that poorer burials that didn't have a headrest, uh, they just had a brick placed under their head. So it was the concept of elevating the body um, that, that it is really important. Um, and once again, we have a uh, really uh, beautiful card, uh, which uh, gives us both the hieroglyphic um, script uh, and also a, a translation of what the text is telling us. Uh, the shape 
of the headrest is really evocative um, of the Egyptians image of the horizon, uh, the Anket. Uh, and we can think of the horizon as a very magical place for the ancient Egyptians. It symbolizes both yesterday and tomorrow. So therefore it is seen really as symbolizing eternity. Uh, it, it, it's incorporating the past, but looking to the future. Um, and we can think that the headrest, this is its basic shape, and um, it is symbolizing the Anket in the hope that just as the sun will rise each morning, you um, as, as a, a living person will rise again each morning. The Egyptians saw the night uh, as a terrifying time, uh, almost uh, akin to death, uh, so that they that they wanted protection uh, from night demons. And indeed, some of the headrests are, are um, in, inscribed with the god Bess, who is seen as a protector of the household, uh, and he is there really warding off uh, demons of the night. But the headrest in the afterlife um, it is associated with the concept of being reborn each morning, um, just as the sun rises again. Uh, again, this is a fancier example which illustrates uh, the function of the uh, the, um, the the Goodison example. Uh, this is from the tomb of Tutankhamun, uh, and here we have uh, the god Shu. Shu is the god um, of, of, of air, uh, so it, it's really a very, very telling um, rendition here. And we can see he, he is lifting Tutankhamun's head up uh, to form this beautiful symbol of the horizon. And we have the two lions here symbolizing uh, eternity. So Tutankhamun will eternally uh, be born again um, each morning as the sun is. Um, and there are references uh, to this um, in the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead is fantastically informative as it often provides us with the function of objects. Uh, and the Book of the Dead uh, here uh, really suggests that the headrests were also uh, provided uh, to protect your head. So so that your head won't be taken from you. Um, but it's this concept of rising yourself that is important. Um, the headrest is so important that we get tiny amulets made of it. Uh, this example, uh, just over a centimetre, could never be used in life, but it's placed in, in the tomb, so the concept of the headrest continues. And we even see uh, the headrest depicted um, in, in books of the dead. Uh, Tutankhamun had a tiny um, amulet of a headrest placed underneath his head also. So headrests are fascinating objects which do have a use in both daily life and the afterlife. And if we look at the base of the Atkinson um, example, we can also see um, that we, we have um, labels which are really informative about the life history of the object. As I said, this collection is fantastic because it tells us not just about ancient Egypt, but it tells us about the history of collecting in, in the, uh, the end of the 19th century. Um, <clears throat> Now, I hasten to add now, uh, numbers are added in a very, uh, a very unobtrusive manner. Uh, we would not be, be adding um, Goodison in, in what does indeed look like uh, liquid paint, uh, if anybody, uh, if any of you are old enough to remember liquid paint. Um, but if we look here, uh, we have these two labels uh, and the, these labels are incredibly informative. Um, we have the, the beautiful title, uh, a pillow from a Theban tomb. Uh, so we can see that, that they are they are aware it's a headrest. Um, and it is from the, the tomb of the God of Ammon of Elephantine. Um, and we can see sec second life. So he's going to he's going to be reborn. 
but it's very interesting because we're told that it's bought in Luxor in 1891. Um, it's exhibited in 1895 at the Burlington FA Club. Now we know that Mrs. Goodison visited in 87 and 97. So was this bought by Reverend Chester uh, and then Mrs. Goodison uh, later buys it. Um, the the, um, the the only uh, sort of downside that the, the only um, problems with the, the the collection um, at the Goodison is the fact that it doesn't have a provenance. We can't say where these objects were found because um, most of them are, are just bought by Mrs. Goodison. Some of the objects that were bought by, by Reverend Chester, it, it is possible to trace them back to um, archaeological reports. Uh, this doesn't mean that they are they are unauthentic. It's just the fact that we can't place them um, precisely precisely um, in excavations. Um, this exhibited at Burlington FA Club. I pondered this for a long time uh, and after I'd got on board the, the concept of, of Everton and the football club, I even wondered if Burlington FA uh, was a football club. Um, it wasn't. Uh, Burlington Fine Arts Club um, existed um, in London um, and originally uh, it was on three floors at 177 Piccadilly uh, and then it moved to Savile Row uh, so it had a, a very swish base and um, it was um, originally uh, used to exhibit um, amateur art uh, works, but because of, of it, its proximity to, to Mayfair and antique dealers, uh, it was also used as an exhibition space. Uh, and it, it, it's very likely that this is, is when that the headrest um, is exhibited here. Um, interestingly, um, <coughs> In addition to, to, to Garstang um, exhibiting his finds here, John Ruskin was a member. Uh, and John Ruskin, we know, uh, he rented a cottage in Connison, uh, which was next door to, to the cottage that Mrs. Goodison uh, and her husband rented. So it is this uh, a, a possible link to how uh, this ex the, the headdress was, uh, was exhibited as part of the, the Burlington Fine Arts uh, Group. So the second, uh, well, uh, no, the third uh, wonderful object that I want to have a look at um, is uh, the uh, paddle doll, so-called paddle doll. Uh, the Atkinson has three of these fantastic um, objects. Uh, um, uh, three, well, one, one is, is quite fragmentary. Um, and I've selected this because uh, not only is it one of my favourite objects, but it, it also appeared um, on Woman's Hour on Radio Four, uh, which is, is uh, I'm not sure there's that that many uh, ancient Egyptian objects uh, which have have actually appeared on uh, on Woman's Hour, uh, and this was on the day that the gallery opened. Um, it, it was uh, quite a, quite an interesting uh, an interesting trip, trip uh, and uh, Jenny Murray uh, was uh, well, was hosting. Uh, and we talked about the, uh, the function and um, the possible functions um, of the paddle doll. Um, they, we can see uh, that the shape of the, uh, the body of the, the uh, figure uh, is actually very reminiscent to a menet counterpose, which is a historic instrument. Um, it, it is depicting the female form, but in a highly um, abstract manner. Uh, we have no facial features. We have the pubic region here, um, and we have probably a hip girdle here. And we have an absolute mass um, of mud beads here, um, which are symbolizing hair. Um, now, although uh, the uh, figure has no legs, 
um, it's highly likely that these are actually symbolising dancers. Uh, scholarship on the work, particularly carried out by Ellen Morris, has traced uh, these uh, figurines uh, mainly to Thebes. Uh, and about 120 of them have a provenance. Uh, Many were found in Middle Kingdom tombs uh, and Ellen suggests that they actually represent dancers. And what we are seeing um, is the, uh, the revelation of the genitals as the dancers do backflips. Um, and this really links to um, a myth um, about Hathor, an Egyptian goddess. Uh, and in this myth, um, the, 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 the contestings of Horus and Seth. Uh, Hathor's father, Ra, is aged and he's tired, so to revitalise him, she reveals her genitals and he laughs. Um, anything goes in the world of Egyptian myth. And the suggestion is that as dancers um, carried out backflips and revealed their genitals, this had a similar effect in revitalising the king. Um, and from this, figurines were made, which were then taken into the tomb in the hope that they, they would revitalise the tomb owner uh, and they would be re revigorated uh, and born again. Um, so we can see uh, these are actually, this is an incredibly well-preserved example. Um, and we do indeed have the rather wonderful card. Um, I know uh, Megan Clark from Liverpool University is doing her PhD about these, and I think she might have done an object of the month talk for the Atkinson um, on them. So th this it is a really a uh, star and a, a key uh, a key figure and um, in the collection. It's the, the, the preservation of, of the, uh, the hair that is, is particularly significant. Hair is very much associated with femininity uh, in ancient Egypt. Uh, and it, it's also associated uh, with sexuality and rebirth and renewal. If we think uh, that the concept of, of hair, we can cut hair off, but it grows again. Um, this is how uh, the figurine is displayed at the Atkinson, beautifully displayed. So we can see all the key elements of it, uh, the pubic region, the, the very possible dress, um, and the, the beautiful long wig um, of the figurine. Uh, so uh, what uh, is quite an unusual, not unique, but an unusual piece um, in a collection um, is the uh, mummy bead net. Um, these bead nets, um, these are really um, created to be spread over the final mummy wrappings. They are there really to protect uh, the deceased. Um, and they uh, they generally are formed with long and short faience beads um, producing a diamond shape. Uh, it's been suggested that this is um, evocative of the, the, the uh, dresses worn by goddesses. Um, but the Atkinson example um, has this beautiful face. Um, and the face, as I said, it's not a unique representation, but it is quite uh, quite an unusual uh, um, representation um, on the, the mummy nets. Um, it could represent the deceased um, or it could represent the goddess Nut. The goddess Nut is an, an Egyptian sky goddess who is very much associated uh, with rebirth and renewal. She is seen to swallow the sun each morning and to give birth to it again each night. Um, and we can see Newt depicted here um, on the inside um, of the, uh, the, the uh, beautiful uh, sarcophagi, which is on display in the gallery. Uh, 
and she has uh, the, the, the blue wig, which is really linking her both to the sky and to water, to these celestial, celestial realms. Uh, and of course, she is placed directly above the deceased, and we can see her, we can think of her as receiving the deceased. Uh, so I thought uh, side by side, these are both quite interesting and varied representations um, of the goddess. Uh, and this is uh, a tomb scene uh, from uh, the Valley of the Kings. It is an abridged image, but it is really showing how Newt swallows the sun and it travels through her body and then it is reborn again um, each morning. So th that is really uh, why we have these representations of Newt very much associated uh, with rebirth and renewal. Another uh, key object um, in the collection is this fantastic bronze votive um, of the goddess Neith. Um, these um, objects, uh, again, the, these are, are common in the, the, the 26th dynasty, uh, so uh, later in the Egyptian period. Um, these were made um, as, um, as gifts to, to gods, uh, and the text on them often um, that the dedicatee um, is, is asking for what we can think of as life blessings. So, these type um, of statues would be placed um, in a temple that they're, they're not uh, they are not uh, funerary offerings at all. Uh, the goddess Neith um, is a, an incredibly interesting goddess. She um, is is one of the, the the earliest gods that we have depicted worship depicted to. Um, she is associated um, with kingship um, and she does have a, a terrifying nature. Um, early texts, so texts inscribed um, inside the, uh, the, the, the pyramids of the fifth dynasty refer to Neith, may the terror of you come into being like the Neith crown which is on the king of lower Egypt. So she has the, the, this terrifying um, association uh, and she is um, often depicted wearing the red crown and we can think of Think of red as sim symbolizing one part of Egypt. Uh, we have the red and the black land, but it, it's also a, a color associated with with with, uh, with blood and with fire, with life and with death. Um, Neith, from the earliest times, is also seen as a creator god and as a mother goddess. So it might be in this capacity, really, that the, these, uh, these statues um, are created. Um, it is interesting that uh, we can see her, her very... Um, her active form because she is taking a, a step forward uh, and generally uh, female deities uh, and fe female um, mortals are depicted with their legs uh, closed together. Uh, striding purposely forward is really a common feature of, of male um, imagery. Um, she would no doubt have held a, a scepter here and wearing the red crown, we see we see no hair depicted, and that might be a reference, really, to to her, her terrifying nature, uh, in a sense, possibly trying to remove uh, some of her femininity. Um, as a goddess, she is um, a, a protector in the funerary realm. Uh, she appears with Selkat uh, and also Nis. Um, Isis and um, Nethsis, and together the four goddesses um, are often depicted uh, protecting uh, the, the, the king. But in this capacity, this statue would have been left um, in a 
temple. Uh, these uh, bronze votives, uh, these are made uh, using the lost wax technique. Uh, so a, a mould would have been made uh, first. Uh, and we only really see them um, in the 25th and the 26th dynasty, as this is really quite a complex process. This, of course, would have been quite uh, an expensive gift, uh, no doubt uh, a gift from a member of the elite. Uh, and um, as, um, as um, in most cases, we do still um, have the card um, for the, uh, for the um, object. We can see there has been uh, an alteration uh, suggesting it's Greco-Roman. I think the date on the card uh, was, uh, was actually uh, correct. That was neither Joe or I who made that, that uh, change. So I just wanted to have a look um, at a, a number of objects which are also um, in, con well, they are in the store. Uh, and I know uh, Joe did want to have some conservation carried out um, on these beautiful coffin, coffin panels. Um, <clears throat> We have used these in handling sessions in the past, and it has been an absolute joy to be able to get so close to them. These yellow uh, coffins, um, as they're referred to, uh, coffins of this time period um, are filled with imagery. And this is because tombs from this time period um, do not have uh, great, uh, great decoration. Uh, tombs from this time period, uh, we don't have any, any huge elaborate decorated tombs. Um, the imagery instead is inscribed on the coffins. So here we can see the, Hith the Hathoric cow uh, and she is standing in front of what, what is uh, the, the, uh, the peak of the West. And we can see the dedicatee here is making an offering to her. And we have Anubis, uh, who is a, a god associated with the necropolis um, here. Um, the yellow uh, we can think of um, as possibly suggesting either gold um, or suggesting the, the, the papyri, that images such as these could also have been worn on, uh, drawn on. Um, so the Atkinson did uh, commission an artist uh, to, uh, to carry out uh, an interpretation um, based um, on the coffin. Uh, and we can see we have a, a successful and accurate rendering. Uh, it's just the colour scheme that has been changed. Um, this was then used to produce these uh, really rather, well, this, this is just one mug uh, I've endeavoured to, to, to uh, show all scenes from it. So this is really uh, just an illustration um, of the very interesting ways that the Atkinson have used the collection. They also um, produced a bread mould, uh, which a friend of mine uh, bought and did actually use to, to uh, make ancient, uh, well, bread in the style um, of ancient Egypt. Um, I'm the proud owner um, of one of these beautiful mugs. Um, there is another um, portion um, of this coffin, which is also um, in the Atkinson store. Uh, we have to imagine Mrs. Goodison uh, transporting these back. And we have to think where these displayed um, in her home on Beach Lawn. Um, texts, uh, letters do suggest that she had uh, what is referred to as a museum room. So it must must have been really quite fantastic if she had some of these uh, these objects um, on display. Um, it's possible that these uh, are representations of the four sons of Horus, deities who were seen to protect uh, the, the individual organs um, of the deceased. Um, although I'm not quite sure who, um, who is being depicted here. Uh, we have the human and the baboon um, representations of the four sons. We generally see the four sons um, as the jackal, the 
the, the falcon, uh, the baboon um, and the human. Uh, so I'm not quite sure um, who is being depicted here. Uh, but the, the colours um, are so beautifully preserved on this um, and I do hope uh, the Atkinson managed to have some conservation carried out on these pieces. Uh, I know um, Aidan Dodson did visit some time ago and did look um, at the coffins um, in the collection. So as I said the Atkinson uses the collection very uh, cleverly um, in the sense that it has its standing collection which is on display permanently. If you haven't been I would urge you to go. Uh, the museum is uh, very easily reached um, from Liverpool uh, 40 minutes on the train. Um, one of the first um, temporary um, exhibitions that uh, the Atkinson um, initiated was the Eye of the Beholder. And this was looking um, at conceptions of beauty uh, in different cultures, one of which was ancient Egypt, also ancient Greece, uh, China, um, Europe and contemporary representations. Uh, and I uh, curated a case um, and this really um, used objects which were in the Atkinson collection and also objects on loan from other collections and that is a very common way to put together a temporary exhibition. It is a good way for museums uh, to, to um, get their objects on display that are normally in stores. Um, and we can see uh, we were fortunate that we were able to um, have um, on loan from Manchester uh, this beautiful image uh, figurine, uh, a caryatid, uh, an 18th dynasty mirror which incorporates this very beautiful image of a, a nubile young girl and th this is a very distinct representation of beauty that we see in ancient Egypt. Uh, these uh, images really represent uh, women in their nubile peak. They are very suggestive um, of fertility. We have to think that the, the mirror disc itself uh, represents the sun and we have the papyrus umbel um, also associated with the goddess Hathor, uh, but the papyrus umbel itself uh, it, it is also uh, in text, uh, is associated with renewal and rebirth. So this is a very interesting um, incorporation um, of a female representation of beauty. The hair is uh, a very, uh, a very uh, distinct, uh, we have a, a tripartite wig, we can see three plaits um, down the back, and that um, has been suggestive that that depicts, uh, it depicts girls, women who are not yet um, of marriable age. Um, and we can see um, in this tomb of Rec Murray, uh, we also have a very similar representation of the hair. Uh, for the exhibition, uh, we were also very fortunate that we could loan uh, the beautiful uh, figurine uh, which Garstang found in a tomb uh, from Abydos. And again, we have the representation uh, of, of a woman in her fertile peak. But here we see a very full wig and indeed we, we see earrings. So although she is devoid of clothes, she is quite elaborately decked uh, and that the suggestion is that these are indeed fertility figurines. Um, so uh, as part of the, the, the conceptions of beauty, uh, we included a small jug uh, which was no doubt used uh, for perfumes um, or oils. Um, and this, uh, this was um, found at Memphis. Uh, and I, I believe that this is one of the pieces that, that um, has been traced uh, to uh, an archeological report. Um, and this is a beautiful um, cosmetic palette. 
Uh, this is actually pre-dynastic. So we can see that the wealth of the material. Uh, this uh, is uh, one of the pieces brought back by Mrs. Goodison. Uh, and we can see scratch marks on it here, uh, where this was very likely used to grind cosmetics. Um, we can see a 15 and a pencil mark. Um, this is how Petrie is known to have marked objects um, on site in his excavations. So it's very likely that this piece came from a Petrie excavation. Uh, the um, Atkinson also um, had a temporary exhibition which was based on photographs and objects which was curated by uh, Stephen Snape from uh, Liverpool uh, University um, and uh, this used a variety um, of material and again also included um, objects from the Atkinson's stores. Uh, some of you might remember the exhibition it's beautifully displayed and had a fantastic map um, of Egypt um, on the floor. There was also a small um, exhibition which imagined what Mrs. Goodison's house uh, would have been like. Um, this was a, a, an, an interpretive display, but it, it was great fun uh, to try um, and place the objects that are on display in the museum and to imagine how they would have been originally displayed in Mrs. Goodison's house um, at Beach Lawn. Um, and we can see we have a, a mixture um, of ancient artifacts and um, modern um, antique pieces to try and evoke Mrs. Goodison's house. Uh, the texts here were based on a panel from uh, the sarcophagi that is actually um, on display in the gallery. And we can see we, we have a replica um, image um, of the sarcophagi. We, we can imagine Mrs. Goodison um, here. Uh, we do know from texts, uh, letters, uh, snippets, that she was a student um, of hieroglyphs, but we don't, we don't know uh, where she studied. Um, in comparison to other female travellers, uh, Mrs. Goodison uh, doesn't publish um, a journal or a diary. Uh, uh, so it, it is it is it is harder for us uh, to really try uh, and piece together um, how how she displayed or studied um, ancient Egypt. Uh, so the last uh, really major temporary exhibition that the, the Goodison um, hosted uh, was uh, Mrs. Goodison and Other Travellers. Um, and this was curated by Tom Hardwick. Uh, and this was a fantastic exhibition. This had pieces on loan from the British Museum, uh, the National Portrait Gallery, the Brooklyn Museum. Um, and it was trying to place Mrs. Goodison's travels um, in the context of other travellers, particularly um, other female travellers. Um, so, as I said, we need to remember that Mrs. Goodison it is following in, in the footsteps um, of some intrepid uh, female travellers to ancient Egypt. Uh, we, of course, I'm sure are all familiar with Amelia Edwards. Um, and due to Amelia's travels um, and her publication of A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, uh, she is really instrumental in establishing the Egypt Exploration Fund, which goes on to become the Egypt Exploration Society. But Amelia was already a writer before she undertakes her travel. She makes her living uh, by, by writing books and, um, and, and articles. Um, we do have some tantalising links between uh, Amelia and Mrs. Goodison uh, and this scribal palette, um, it is alleged, um, was a gift from Amelia uh, to Mrs. Goodison uh, and we can still see the black, uh, the black ink here. Um, and we can see we still have the, uh, the card that goes along with it. Uh, it's also alleged that uh, this box, this paint box, 
was a gift from uh, Amelia to Mrs Goodison and again it is Coptic uh, we can see the ink cakes still surviving. Um, we do find um, as part of the exhibition uh, this head of a men and men hat the third was displayed uh, because this was uh, an object uh, which uh, Amelia uh, did uh, donate um, to the um, the E, -E uh, the uh, Petrie Museum um, in London uh, and we, we can see This is uh, the Petrie uh, Collection uh, catalogue uh, reference, and we can see uh, it was beautifully displayed as part um, of the Atkinson uh, Gallery, uh, the, the, the Travellers uh, Exhibition. Uh, just to re remind ourselves that uh, Mrs. Goodison, uh, oh, sorry, uh, that uh, Amelia uh, did travel uh, in what we might think of um, in a very splendid style uh, in a Dabea, uh, which is alleged to have 18 cabins, a dining room and a bathroom. Uh, this was painted uh, by Marianne Brocklehurst and Marianne is in many respects uh, an interesting contemporary, uh, well a forerunner really uh, to, uh, to, to Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Goodison. Um, as Marianne uh, uh, travels um, with um, with Amelia. Uh, they do not know each other initially, but um, when they are both in Egypt, they meet at Shepherds and they travel the length um, of the Nile together. Uh, and uh, Marianne does um, publish, um, well, rather her diary um, is published. Um, so as I said, unlike Mrs. Goodison, we have no, uh, no texts uh, for Mrs. Goodison, but there is a possible link because um, Marianne, uh, she refers to talk, uh, speaking to Mr. Ogle, the curator of Boothal Museum, um, and is is asking about setting up um, a museum in Macclesfield uh, and she does this on, on the suggestion of Mrs Goodison. So we can see some sort of tantalising links between Mrs Goodison, uh, Amelia um, and, um, and Marianne. Um, and this is just a beautiful image, which is, is showing the two ladies at Dabeas, um, Mary Ann's and Amelia's, and is demonstrating how they, they travelled uh, the, the, uh, the, the length of the Nile together. This diary um, is um, on display, well, the diary is in Macclesfield uh, Museum. Um, you you used to be able to request uh, to see it. I'm obviously not sure whether that is possible now, but again, it is a fantastic piece of social history. Um, <clears throat> the um, exhibition also dealt with um, and considered the contribution of Margaret Benson. Margaret Benson, uh, another one of the, these really um, pioneering ladies, uh, one of the uh, first uh, women to, uh, to receive a degree um, at Oxford. Um, and she, after her education, she cannot um, she cannot embark upon a career and um, so she um, travels to Egypt and she travels to Egypt as a tourist um, in 1894. Um, as I said, um, it, an interest in Egypt is uh, an acceptable pursuit for these uh, middle class uh, ladies. Um, but what is uh, is very interesting is that she visits the temple of Mut, and this is really under the suggestion um, of what she refers to as the donkey boys. So the uh, the the, uh, the the young men who are are transporting um, transporting her around Egypt, and they suggest that she visits the temple of Mut because there are lots of statues with cat heads and they think that she might like it. Um, and while she is there, uh, she starts to think about uh, would it be possible 
to carry out an excavation. And she does indeed uh, gain a permit and carries out three seasons of work at the Temple of Moot, uh, which is quite a, a fantastic endeavour. If we think um, at home, she would not be able to vote. But here she did uh, carry out uh, a, a wonderful uh, series um, of, of three excavations. Uh, this is one of the photos uh, from it. Uh, this, this head was displayed um, in the uh, Atkinson, uh, Mrs. Goodison and Travellers exhibition because this was found um, in the Temple of Moot by Margaret Benson. Um, Benson. Um, it was originally believed uh, to be a female. It's now accepted that this hairstyle is, uh, is, is commonly used uh, to depict uh, men. So I think we will uh, we will end there. Apologies uh, for going slightly over, but there is so much material to consider uh, with uh, the Goodison Collection, uh, what, 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 what they have done uh, and hopefully what they can uh, perhaps think about doing in the future. So uh, thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Jo. Um, oh, that was so good. It's It's been so long since we've been able to revisit the Egyptology. It was just been, yeah, that's been a joy. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think a couple of questions have come in. So if you want to have a little look I'll through a, them. I'll have a browse I'll, while I have a drink of water. I'll just do a shout out for the next couple of talks. Um, on the 3rd of November at 7 o'clock, there's a cracking title, we have got... I was stabbed at the Adelphi Theatre, I Cannot Rest, 19th Century Theatre Ghosts. Um, and that's by Dr. Catherine Quirk, who's a lecturer in drama and creative arts at Edge Hill University. So what she's fascinated is, is this thing, what the uh, Victorians had with the whole fascination with ghosts and, and spirits lingering in theatre spaces and things. So that's what she's going to be looking at. And on the 10th of November at one o'clock, uh, we'll be looking at one of the paintings in the Atkinson's collection, which is Artemis by John Collier. And that's by just Georgina Muscat uh, from Liverpool University. So again, if you've not seen the picture, if you Google it online, you can see it. Um, but it's a beauty. And John Collier is an amazing artist. So hopefully that should be something that people will be interested in as well. So um, if you've got any questions, feel free to um, send them via chat now. Um, while Joe has a quick look. Um, do you think, Joe, that one of the beauties of the collection at the Atkinson is, I know we haven't got a lot of provenance of Mrs. Goodison's material, but it's, a collection that she collected so you know you go to a lot of the bigger museums and it's it's a huge collection but it's it's come in in bits and pieces over the years from lots of different places whereas this is what she selected yeah. it's her collection yeah I, I, what what i like about it is is the fact that yes it, it is telling the story of egypt and you and i tried to pick out some key themes but it, it is also um a set of objects that were collected by a woman who who is relatively local to, to, to the Atkinson. If we think that she, she lived at Waterloo, that that's no no yeah, great yeah. distance. So it, it's also telling the story of, of a local lady, you know, and, and quite it is quite intrepid if we think of, of the, the, the 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 time period. Um, yeah. To, to, to have gone to gone out to Egypt, no doubt she 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 will she will have obviously been able to to afford to hire a drag man and various people to to, to look after her. But it, it's still an intrepid thing to do. So yeah, and it, as you said, the fact that it's one it, it's just one collection is quite remarkable. If we think Marianne brought back about five hundred objects, uh, and that's that's at Macclesfield. Uh, that is um, that is really. Uh, it's an interesting collection, but the, the, the Goodison collection has much more depth to it. Um, yeah. yeah. The, the, the Macclesfield collection, for me, the best thing about it is the, is the, is the, the diary. The diary is fantastic with, with the drawings. And if only we had had something of Mrs. Goodison's, uh, something, so I know, I know, and no images. When I was putting it together, I purposely left the, those two blanks because I think it's quite telling that we've got this big hole. We've got not no images of the women that were involved in this. It, it, it's it, it's really uh, quite quite sad. Um, but yes, it, it is. It, it's wonderful that the collection stayed together. I'm so glad that that uh, it wasn't split up and and sold in, in, in bits and pieces because that that would have just been heartbreaking. Um, and it, it's a wonderful resource for, for, for local people um, because 
you know, it, it is free. You can wander around, and then there's the stand that the the temporary exhibitions, which just bring new life to it, don't they? Yes. yes. Right then. Yes, there, there, there's, there's, I can't see any questions, but there's people, lots of people saying that they're, they're going to make a visit. So that's good, isn't it? But hopefully we, we'll, uh, we'll get some, some more visitors. I haven't been myself uh, since, uh, since uh, the lockdown uh, and I, I've missed wander, wandering around the gallery as um, I used to spend quite a lot of time there doing objects of the month and handling sessions and and it is it is a wonderful collection and i mean that there, there there is uh even in stores that that, that that there's more material isn't there that the pre-dynastic material in stores is great that there's a huge amount of palettes and all sorts of things uh yeah krishna's saying that those victorian ladies yes the victorian ladies are fantastic that they're, they're, they're quite uh, quite formidable aren't they <laughs> Right then, I can't. I can't actually see any questions. Oh, there's one just come in saying, um, um, "What do you think about the ethical question of Mrs. Goodison taking from Egypt and preserving their culture?" That's yeah, that's a big thing of late, uh, isn't what it? What do I think about it? Well, I, I think at, at the time, Mrs. Goodison is not doing anything illegal. Um, it is it is perfectly acceptable to buy objects and that is is how uh, the british museum uh, and and a whole array of museums have acquired their collection and, and if we think reverend chester he's selling to museums all over the, the world now any objects found in egypt stay in egypt and that's been the case since I think it's only about the 70s or 80s. I think it is. It is relatively. It is relatively late. Um, but at the time, th th there there is nothing Ill illegal going on. Um, so it's it's easy to to, to look back and and um, sort of condemn uh, previous people's actions. But I think the the good thing about it is that we've got this whole collection. Uh, you just just what we were talking about before. And it, it, it doesn't just talk about Egypt, it talks about social history, it talks yeah. about the yeah. women. And that's why I, I really enjoyed the Mrs. Goodison and Friends, because it placed Mrs. Goodison in the context of the, these other travellers. Um, and and, um, and we, we can see uh, how, how she, you know, she, she fit, fits in with that. Um, so... Um, we wouldn't well you wouldn't be able to, to go to Egypt now and amass a collection um but uh, I I don't think we can re really condemn Mrs Goodison um because it, in many respects um, it, it is a wonderful resource that is now um for for local local people um yeah so I think that's kind of it, it is such a hard topic to kind of deal with but from from our perspective it is a historical collection it was collected by a local lady and i think the one thing that you can take from these objects that are in museums and galleries across the country and um, across the world it gives access to them objects to people that couldn't go to egypt to see them yeah um so it, it's that it's another way of people being educated to actually understand uh, another culture you could argue about it all day long. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. But the, yeah. the, the, the it's definitely one of the things that it, it's a collection that we are now custodians of. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we can't go back in time. No, but what we can do, uh, and I think the Atkinson has done, done brilliantly, is that, that they've made the, the collection um, accessible because for 40 yeah. years it was in storage. So it, it, it was, I mean, if you haven't got anywhere to display it that's the best thing to do with it to, to keep it safe in storage so that that was the right thing to do at the time because the, the, there was nowhere to display it but yeah. now it is accessible uh you get loads of school children visiting don't you joe uh, <laughs> uh well you did uh, pro 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 probably not not yeah. at the moment um and that it, it is a a, a local resource uh, so as you said it, it's impossible to um to, t to turn back that that time that the collection is here and all, all all we can do is is to make sure that it, it is preserved um and uh, maintained for for future for future yes, generations absolutely. 
Right. Um, I don't think anything else has come through no. in between. Um, no. We've had an amazing array of visitors today. We've been quite international today, which has been lovely. Jolly good. Um, I, right. I, I, I did my little promotion bit, so because uh, it. it I'm going to look at some of, some of the, the talks that you, uh, you, you suggested because they sound great and see if I'm free and I hopefully can, can, can join you in the audience. <laughs> Thank you. And um, if anybody wants to come and see us, um, we're on Monday to Saturday 10 till 4.